Serial killers are always something that most people will forever be both puzzled and terrified by. Up until the mid-1990s, prior to when DNA evidence was widely submissible in a criminal court, law enforcement struggled to connect multiple murders to a singular perpetrator. On top of that, different departments of law enforcement were vehemently opposed to working with one another due to the innate desire for the glory derived from solving high-profile cases. This becomes even more difficult to do when a particular deviant decides to not only jump from city to city, but across state lines. One such person is an extremely depraved man who committed a string of terrible crimes from 1982 to 1984. Though he was only convicted of two murders, it is believed that he is responsible for up to 24 in total. Let's take a look inside the depraved case of a man known as both the Interstate Killer and the Highway Killer, Larry William Eiler. <laughs> Larry William Eiler was born the youngest of four children in Crawfordsville, Indiana on December 21st, 1952 into an extremely turbulent family. His father, George Howard Eiler, was a violent alcoholic who physically and emotionally abused his children and wife, Shirley Phyllis Kennedy, to the point where the marriage ended while Larry was two. Though she could not provide for her children and would have to put them in foster homes throughout their young life, Shirley would work multiple jobs and frequently visit her children while they were in foster care. She tried to be a good mother to her children, but her penchant for marrying violent alcoholics would continue the abuse their biological father began, with one using drowning in scalding hot water as a form of discipline for the young boy. His torture over his early years continued while attending St. Joseph's School in Lebanon, Indiana, where his classmates would frequently bully him for being poor and for having divorced parents. This caused his behavior to become so increasingly erratic that by the time he was 10, his mother placed him in a home for unruly boys, only to take him back because his stay was so traumatic. Eiler's issues were boiled down to a mix of average intelligence, severe insecurity, and extreme abandonment issues after a psychological evaluation at a child guidance clinic. This was believed, justifiably from what I've already described, that all these issues stemmed from his home life and was placed in a Catholic boy's home in Fort Wayne for all of six months before returning to his mother's care. Though he dated women in high school, it was merely a ruse to hide his deep-seated shame and hatred of himself due to his religious upbringing for being gay. He would drop out of high school, obtain a GED, and attend college before taking his first job at Marion County General Hospital as a security guard. His employment terminated after six months. He would take on a new job at a shoe store and finally begin exploring his sexuality, becoming well known in the Indianapolis gay community, particularly the leather fetish community. Eiler's partners have stated that he was an outwardly laid-back guy, but underneath he had a sadistic streak with a violent temper during sex, potentially visualizing them as women as he shouted profanities at them while he bludgeoned and stabbed them. He was also known to bring lovers from the gay bars he frequented to aid his socially inept roommate, 38-year-old science professor Robert David Little, in finding sexual release. The first time he dipped his toe into the dark waters of murder was on August 9th, 1978, when he picked up a 19-year-old hitchhiker named Craig Long and threatened him at knife point after a rejected proposition for sex. He drove out into the middle of nowhere when the shackled Long attempted to flee from him, shouting expletives and receiving a stab wound in the lung before Eiler fled the scene, believing the boy to be dead. Long stumbled into a nearby home and paramedics were summoned, police showing up at Eiler's home to arrest him for aggravated battery. 
He initially pled guilty to this charge and was bailed out by friends only to change his plea to not guilty after paying Long off with a $2,500 check to drop the charges against him. Eiler would then enter into an extremely toxic long-term relationship with a married man with five kids, three that were fosters, named John Dubrovolsky, where both men would indulge in their sadomasochistic tendencies. The toxic part comes in with the two fighting constantly over Dobrovolsky's infidelity, most of these fights starting because Robert Little, more than likely, was in love with Eiler. Please keep in mind that I don't have any proof of Little actually being in love with his roommate. This is purely speculation based upon my opinion, and that opinion is based on Little's absolute resentment towards Eiler and Dobrovolsky's relationship, along with the fact that he allowed Eiler to stay rent-free at his home on the weekends. Eiler's second attempted murder victim was 21-year-old Craig Townsend, who was picked up in Crown Point, Indiana, and was drugged, beaten, and abandoned in a rural field naked and in a comatose state. Though Townsend was in horrible condition when he was found, he did survive his wounds. Eiler would go on to have a very specific M.O. where he would pick his victims up and sedate them with drugs and or alcohol before he tied them up, tortured them, and then either stabbed and or slashed them to death. He would then dump the bodies of his victims in fields close to major interstate highways with their pants and underwear around their ankles and steal their shirts and wallets. This would later escalate to varying degrees, several victims being disemboweled and four being dismembered. His first murder victim was 19-year-old Stephen Crockett, who was picked up October 23rd, 1982, before being stabbed 32 times and dumped in a cornfield in Kanaki County. His second victim was 26-year-old Edgar Underkofer, who was abducted October 30th, 1982, and was found in a field close to Danville, Illinois, March 4th, 1983. A third victim named John Johnson, age 25, was found in Lowell, Indiana one month after Underkofer was killed. 23-year-old Stephen Agin was the next to befall Eiler's rage on December 19th and was found in a woodland near Indiana State Road 63 nine days later, a nearby abandoned farm being discovered as the site of his murder due to the flesh on the walls. The coroner, Dr. John Pless, stated that there is a possibility of there being more than one person involved in Egan's murder due to how extensive the damage to his body was, noting how mutilated his abdomen, chest, and throat were. Dr. Pless also performed the autopsy of Eiler's next victim, 21-year-old John Roach, who was found close to Interstate 70 in Puntum County the day after Egan's autopsy. The sixth victim, 22-year-old David Block, was picked up December 30th only to be found in a field south of Illinois Route 173 on May 7th, 1984. 16-year-old Irvin Gibson was taken January 24th, 1983 from Lake County and was discovered April 15th atop another body of a dead dog. It is believed that five other victims between the ages of 17 and 29 were abducted and murdered between March and April 1983. The body of 21-year-old Daniel Scott McNeve was found in a field by Indiana State Road 39 in Hendricks County on May 9th with 11 stab wounds to his neck, five to his back, and another 11 to his abdomen, which caused a form of disemboweling. Oddly enough, McNeve was found in the same state with signs of binding on his wrist and ankles and his pants pulled down, but there was no sign of sexual assault like the rest of Eiler's victims. 25-year-old Richard Bruce was abducted from Effingham, Illinois and dumped off the side of a bridge into a creek where he was found December 5th, 1983. At this point, Indiana authorities took notice of this string of murders and disappearances, connecting them to the gay community before beginning to survey and raid gay bars and bookstores to identify anyone who could possibly be the perpetrator or perpetrators. A gay newspaper called The Works created an anonymous telephone hotline and offered a $1,500 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of whomever was responsible for these horrifying murders, doing all they could to help law enforcement's efforts. This became such an unsettling situation that four cases in different jurisdictions were linked together, 35 total detectives attending a meeting to combine the investigations together into a task force comprised of 
the following. Two detectives from state police, two detectives from Indianapolis police, and two from each county involved in the investigations. This task force would be heralded by Lieutenant Jerry Campbell of the Indianapolis Police and was called the Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigation Team. All information collected placed into a computerized database connected to the statewide police system. The task force contacted the FBI National Crime Information Center and put out a nationwide bulletin requesting that any law enforcement entity contact them if they discover any bodies fit in the profile of those they were already tracking, receiving a response from Kentucky not long after. 29-year-old Jay Reynolds had been found stabbed to death in Madison County on March 22nd, the state in which he was found matching the profile given by the task force. Chicago investigators were the next to contact the task force, reporting that an 18-year-old African-American boy named Jimmy Roberts had been found in Thorn Creek on May 9th with 35 stab wounds to his body. After these cases were linked to the four being investigated by the task force, Eiler was officially dubbed the Highway Murderer. Eiler would become a prime suspect for the now multi-state task force on June 6th when a former lover, Thomas Henderson, called in to notify them of the attempted murder of Long back in 1978 along with the violent temper and love for bondage. Henderson also notified them of Eiler's part-time employment at a Greencastle liquor store, his residence at Little's home, and that in May 1982, a 14-year-old boy was kidnapped and abandoned after being sedated by Eiler. An investigation into Henderson's claims resulted in the task force deciding to informally track Eiler's whereabouts due to his frequent travels between Chicago and Indianapolis. The FBI would then put together a psychological profile of the highway murderer, stating that they would most likely be a white male in his late 20s or early 30s who presented a rough exterior due to his self-hatred because of his being gay and probably worked a low-paying job. I'm going to use the following summary from Murderpedia to cover the rest of what the FBI profilers came up with. The individual would project a macho image and seek the company and approval of other masculine males to feel a sense of belonging. As such, this individual would frequent redneck bars and be something of a night owl yet live on the edge of homosexual panic, always fearful of being labeled by others as queer. Because of this fear, this offender may express a hatred of homosexuals to mask his sexual attraction to those whom he sought the acceptance of. Furthermore, the FBI predicted that upon completion of a murder, the offender would symbolically erase the act by making a rudimentary effort to cover his victim with leaves or soil, and that this individual likely had a middle-aged, middle-class, and markedly more intelligent accomplice in several of his initial homicides. As many victims had been athletic and lithe in stature, this profile also predicted the offender to be a physically strong individual. The predictions within this profile regarding the offender's strength were supported by the presence of deep welt marks on the wrists of many victims, suggesting they had struggled to resist being bound and handcuffed. Keep in mind that, once again, this is an excerpt from Murderpedia's summarization of what the FBI had said, but geez, when the FBI is on it, they're really on it when it comes to profiles of serial killers. Another body of an unidentified Hispanic man that had been dumped as early as June 27th was found on July 2nd in Paxton, Illinois. The body had multiple abdominal stab wounds and was half-dressed like most of the other victims consistent with Arler's crimes. Another body was found by tree trimmers near Illinois Route 60 on August 31st, that of 28-year-old Ralph Calise, who had seven stab wounds to his abdomen and was partially disemboweled. These murders and an additional three were brought to the attention of the task force by Chicago-based reporter for WLS-TV, Gerald Kolarik, as of September 8th and effectively grew the task force. 18-year-old Eric Hansen's limbless and headless torso was found inside of a plastic bag in Kenosha County, Wisconsin by mushroom hunters after going missing from St. Francis on September 27th. The torso was completely drained of blood and the skull and hands were never found. 
Eiler was arrested in Lowell, Indiana for a traffic violation, but was detained for soliciting sex from a young hitchhiker he was arrested with because of two pieces of nylon rope discovered inside his vehicle. Unfortunately, this was already a compromised situation because Sergeant William Cothran searched Eiler's Ford F-Series pickup at roadside before informing him of his being under arrest. He was interviewed by task force members the same day and denied his sexuality along with being involved in the murders of John Roach and Daniel McNeve. Though he did consent to forensic examination of his vehicle, his fingerprints and mud shot being taken, and to a lie detector test later. The following was found in the impounded vehicle, a knife with blood beneath the handle, a hammer, two baseball bats, two sections of nylon rope, a mallet, and surgical tape. Eiler's footwear was matched to plaster casts of imprints found by the body of Ralph Calise, along with his tires being matched to the tracks there as well. Though he was released with his vehicle, a search warrant for Robert Little's home was obtained and executed October 2nd to ensure their prime suspect in the string of murders wouldn't be able to get rid of any evidence. Credit card receipts placing Eiler in the vicinity of some of the victims at the time of their murder in Illinois and Indiana, along with phone bills indicating collect calls were made to Little shortly after others were believed to have been murdered were found during this search. For example, one of these calls were made on April 8th from a payphone by Cook County Hospital where he had been admitted for a deep cut on his hand around the time Gustavo Herrera had been killed. It was also discovered that Eiler and Little just returned from a New York vacation shortly before Calise's murder. Eiler and his vehicle were once again taken into custody, investigators getting Eiler to admit to his sexuality and his toxic relationship with Don Rivalski. It was also alleged that, according to Eiler, Dobrovolsky was physically abusive. Detectives received a wince in response when the following was said. Larry, we know something about you. You'd get into a fight with John and pick someone else and stab him because you think it's John. Eiler was, once again, released from custody October 4th and used this time to find representation in a lawyer named Kenneth Dukowski, who turned around and filed a suit for $250,000 on assertion that the Lake County Sheriff's Police and the Indiana State Police violated his client's 14th Amendment and civil rights by involving him to get sufficient evidence for his arrest. All imprints found at the murder scene of Ralph Calise were sent to FBI headquarters in DC for analysis. Investigators receiving confirmation that boot impressions were a precise match down to the wear and tear on the soles along with the tires being a perfect match in terms of grip and depth. The civil suit was filed on October 11th against 11 named officers involved in the task force. A skeletonized body of an unidentified white male between the ages of 18 and 26 was found in a field close to Rensselaer, Indiana on October 15th. Four more decomposed bodies were found three days later near an abandoned farmhouse in Lake Village, Indiana, all of which had more than two dozen stab wounds with their pants pulled down to their ankles. It was determined that three of the victims were white and one was of African-American descent, the African-American one being between the ages of 15 and 18. The task force came together again on October 27th and two jurisdictions believed that there was enough to try him for murder, getting a warrant to get Eiler's hair and blood the next day. The day after the warrant was requested and obtained, the civil court case began with Dikowski requesting access to the affidavit investigators used to obtain a warrant to search Eiler's vehicle. The request was denied at that time, and the warrant for DNA, hair, and blood evidence was executed as Eiler left the courtroom. He was also arrested, formally charged, and a bond was set at $1 million. A second search warrant for Robert Little's residence was obtained and executed on November 1st to verify if the missing t-shirts and wallets from the victims were kept as trophies, the only evidence being found that connected him directly to any case being a matching key to one found under Stephen Egan's body. The key was found to be for an office door to a place Isla worked out of in 1982. David Scheibers replaced Ditkowski as legal representative for Eiler as of November 12th, and the trial started with an evidentiary hearing in December 1983 where the reciting judge, William Block, ruled that even if the arrest for the traffic violation was legal, the subsequent detaining in search of his vehicle wasn't. 
During this time, the skeletal remains of 17-year-old Richard Wayne and an unidentified African-American male were found by a hunter by U.S. Route 40 in Hendricks County on December 7th. Another hearing to determine whether the evidence during the illegal search should be allowed into trial took place January 23rd, 1984, where the testimony was given to support its illegality and that the October 3rd search had been conducted without a warrant. Judge Block rendered a decision to suppress a lot of the evidence that would be vital to a conviction, citing the exclusionary rule due to Eiler's interrogation about the murders violating his civil rights. Because of it, all evidence except for the tire impressions, hair, and blood samples obtained through the recent warrant were ruled as inadmissible, with Eiler's bond being lowered to $10,000. He was then released on bond February 6th, with all appeals to overturn this ruling to suppress evidence being rejected. Eiler permanently relocated to a complex in Roger Parks, which was in Chicago, with Robert Little paying for all furniture, rent, and new tires for the pickup truck. <clears throat> Once again, I'd like to point out my opinion that Little was absolutely in love with Eiler. Yeah, I think he was, especially because of what I just said. All jokes aside, what comes next is extremely disheartening and a scar on law enforcement and the criminal justice system as a whole. On August 19th, Eiler took the life of another victim, that of 16-year-old Daniel Bridges. Bridges was a habitual runaway and the youngest of 13 children who, oddly enough, was a friend of another victim of Eiler's depravity, Irvin Gibson. His death occurred after being tied to a chair with clothesline in Eiler's Chicago apartment. He was then tortured and stabbed to death, his body cut into eight pieces and drained of all blood in Eiler's bathroom before being placed in plastic bags. These bags were then discovered in the dumpster near the apartment two days later by Joseph Ball, a janitor for the complex who believed that these bags were illegally dumped trash only to discover a severed human leg in the first bag he opened. This was immediately reported to the police, and other janitors attested to seeing Eiler place the bags in question in the dumpster the day before, police immediately placing him and Dobrovolsky, who was also in the apartment, under arrest. Dobrovolsky was released without charge, but Eiler remained in custody while his apartment was searched for two straight days. Bridges' blood was found everywhere in the apartment, along with blood-stained clothing, a hacksaw, and bags that tied the ones used to conceal his body parts. By the end of the day on August 22nd, Eiler was officially charged and proceeded to deny all involvement, as well as claim that his fingerprints were placed on the trash bags that contained body parts. The autopsy found excessive damage done to Bridges' body, including some wounds that were likely inflicted by an ice pick or an awl. Eiler was brought to trial for these crimes almost two years later and was charged with aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, murder, and concealment of the body on July 1st, 1986. The trial was presided over by Judge Joseph Urso, as Eiler pled not guilty to all charges, his defense team arguing that nobody had witnessed the murder, two other people had been at the apartment for extensive periods around the time the body parts were found, and that there was no evidence that Bridges was involuntarily at the apartment to begin with. The first witness for the prosecution was Robert Little, who testified to having been in the apartment from August 17th to 19th, but had left for home at 10.15pm that evening just before Bridges' murder. The next day, Dr. Robert Stein was next to testify regarding the extensive evidence of torture and mutilation on the body, stating it was one of the worst cases he had ever seen, as well as conceding that there are traces of alcohol and cocaine in his blood. On July 4th, one of the janitors that had claimed to see Eiler testified that he saw him make 8 to 12 trips to his communal storage locker the day after the murder, adding that he saw another three trips being made a few hours after that. On July 7th, Dropovolsky testified for the prosecution and stated that he called Eiler three times around the time of the murder, at 8.45pm and 11.25pm on the night of the murder, and then again at 2.45am the day after. On the final call, he was told that Little was still there and that he wasn't to come over, only agreeing to come over to Dobrovolsky's place after he threatened to show up unannounced. 
It was particularly noted by Dolbovolsky that the entire situation was unusual because Little usually left on Sundays, Euler arrived after having recently bathed, and there was no interest in sex that night. This caused a bit of a disruption and gave the defense a little ammunition to put holes in the case against their client. A tax receipt for property taxes on Little's home was admitted into evidence to prove he was at his home on August 20th, even though the tax bill wasn't due until October and had been paid due to sufficient funds being available at the time. It was suggested that Little could quite possibly be involved and had only returned home to pay the bill in person so an alibi would be in place, citing that the bill was usually paid via the mail. The prosecution countered the argument that Bridges went to Eiler's residence willingly for sex by having technician Mario Caparuso testify that there was no semen found upon or within the victim's body. What was puzzling about this testimony is that there was blood that didn't belong to Eiler or Bridges found on an ashtray in the apartment. Closing arguments were rendered on July 9th with the prosecution stating the murder was premeditated because of the injuries Bridges sustained, while the defense stated that there was no evidence of premeditation and that there is reason to believe that Little may have committed the crime due to the wonky testimony he gave. It took the jury three hours to find Eiler guilty of all counts, the penalty phase taking place September 30th with the prosecution arguing for the death penalty due to Eiler's record of violently assaulting four other gay men between 1978 and 1981. The defense tried to mitigate this on October 1st with the emotional testimony and family members and the argument that the death penalty wouldn't be appropriate due to Eiler's conviction being based on purely circumstantial evidence. Judge Urso listened to both arguments and returned on October 3rd to sentence Eiler to death by lethal injection, stating the following. The senseless and barbaric murder of a 16-year-old boy, a killing which was so brutal it defies description, shows me your complete disregard for human life. If there was ever a person or a situation for which the death penalty is appropriate, it is you. You are an evil person. You truly deserve to die for your acts. I thereby sentence you to death for the murder of Danny Bridges, committed during the course of his aggravated kidnapping. Eiler was then transferred to Pontiac Correctional Center, where he was given multiple psychiatric evaluations and diagnosed with bipolar personality disorder. Experts theorizing that the murders happened due to feelings of rejection by Dobrovolsky and the desire to maintain a sense of control. A formal appeal to overturn his conviction was filed in May 1988, was heard in May 1989 and was dismissed on October 25th, 1989. In November 1990, attorney Kathleen Zellner was appointed as Eiler's representation for his remaining appeals. The very next month, Vermilion County Prosecutor Larry Thomas obtained the evidence for the Ralph Calise case to use in the case against Eiler for the murder of Stephen Agin, and when Eiler caught word of this, he confessed to the murder and insisted that Little was involved. A 17-page written confession was given on December 4th in exchange for a 60-year prison sentence that was rendered December 18th. Little was formally arrested on charges of first-degree murder and was facing 60 years in prison if convicted for aiding in the murder. Kathleen Zellner reached out to the task force and stated, on Eiler's behalf, that if his death sentence was converted to life imprisonment, he would confess to 20 further murders committed across 10 counties in Illinois and Indiana. This was ultimately rejected due to the resistance of Cook County State Attorney Jack O'Malley. Little's trial started on April 11, 1991, before Judge Don Darnell where he offered a not guilty plea. Eiler was the main witness against his former roommate and stated that Little was the one who suggested the murder of Agin while taking pictures of the act, saying they should do a scene. They allegedly lured Agin into Little's car with the promise of alcohol and payment for his participation in a photograph bondage session, taking him to an abandoned shed near Indiana State Road 63 and tying him above a beam. It is then alleged that Little told Eiler to get out the knife, masturbating while he watched the other man stab Agin. While being cross-examined, Eiler admitted to Bridget dismemberment but pled the fifth for most other questions regarding other murders. When asked about where the photographs went, Eiler stated that Little had disposed of them after the 1983 search and were not found because of Little's room not being searched. 
Dr. John Pless took the stand on April 12th to testify about how heinous the damage to Egan's body was, most of which being done after Egan was already dead and stating the following. This is the most extensively mutilated body I've seen without the body being cut into pieces. Little's mother was there to testify for her son, stating he had not been in Indiana at any time during the time of Egan's murder because he would be at her home every year since she moved to Florida and always came down a week before Christmas. She also stated that he stayed at her home the year Egan was killed until New Year's Day, meaning he was not in the state at the time. However, this was proven incorrect due to two pieces of evidence. Ledger records that Little's car had been brought to a Terry Hout garage on December 21st, 1982, and a phone bill with proof that a call had been made from Little's home on the same day. Closing arguments were rendered on April 17th, the jury acquitting Little of all charges just after they began their deliberation the same day. Larry Eiler died on March 6, 1944 due to AIDS-related complications that persisted over the course of 10 years in the infirmary of the Pontiac Correction Center before he could see the end to his next appeal. Two days later, Zellner held a press conference revealing the names and or descriptions of an additional 20 murders that Eiler had confessed to committing with the alleged assistance and guidance of Little. The following victims were listed in the posthumous confession. Stephen Crockett, 19, on October 23, 1982. Edgar Underkolfer, 26, on October 30, 1982. John Johnson, 25, in November 1982. John Roach, 21, on December 22, 1982. David Block, 22, on December 30, 1982. Irvin Gibson, 16, on January 24, 1983. John Bartlett, 19, on March 2, 1983. Michael Bauer, 22, on March 8, 1983. Richard Wayne, 17, on March 20, 1983. Gustavo Herrera, 28, on April 8, 1983. Jimmy Roberts, 18, on May 4, 1983. Daniel McNeve, 21, on May 7, 1983. Richard Bruce, 25, on May 18, 1983. John Brandenburg Jr., 19, on May 29, 1983. Unidentified Hispanic male between the ages of 20 and 25 found in Ford County, Illinois, on July 2, 1983. Ralph Calise, 28, on August 31, 1983. Unidentified Caucasian male between the ages of 18 and 26 found in Jasper County, Indiana on October 15, 1983. Unidentified African American male between the ages of 15 and 18 found in Newton County, Indiana on October 18, 1983. Unidentified African American male between the ages of 25 and 39 found in Hendricks County, Indiana on December 7, 1983. Unidentified Caucasian male between the ages of 16 and 19 found in Cook County, Illinois, April 1984. Though he did not confess to them, it is still believed Eiler was responsible for the murders of two other victims, bringing his total count to 24. J. Reynolds, 29, on March 22, 1983, and Eric Henson, 18, on September 27, 1983. Zellner claimed, on behalf of her late client, that Eiler committed these crimes at the behest of Little due to his seeing the man as a father figure, and that because Eiler had already known he would die at the time of Little's trial, that he had been truthful and without incentive to lie. She also stated that he claimed the t-shirts of his victims were taken as sexual trophies for Little's use. After Eiler was convicted for the murder of Daniel Bridges, Judge William Block was publicly shamed for his suppression of evidence in the Calise case and the reduction of his bond sum, causing his attempt at being appointed to the Illinois Appellate Court to be unsuccessful. John Dobrovolsky died of AIDS in January 1990 at the age of 29. Robert Little continued his tenure as a teacher at Indiana State University and continued to deny any involvement in the murders Eiler committed. Finally, Kathleen Zellner continued to practice law and promised to herself and the public that she would never knowingly defend another guilty individual again. And so ends our deep dive into the case of Larry William Eiler. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please hit the like button and subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. Leave a comment in the comment section below if you so choose, and I will see you on the next case.
I wanted to take this time to thank my Patreons and channel members. Your support is so greatly appreciated and I can't thank you enough. If you'd like to become a Patreon, there is a link in the description below. And if you'd like to become a channel member, just go ahead and click that join button and join the Truth Sleuths into Horror Hounds. All channel members and Patreons receive 24-hour access to videos prior to their public release and exclusive updates on my progress. After a certain tier, you can request that I do a certain topic or movie review, or you can even request that I do a game live stream, whichever works for you. At the highest tier, you not only get to choose the topic in which I cover, you get to either co-host the stream or the video that I do that covers said topic, no matter if it's one or multiple. Of course, this is not obligatory. If you want to support the channel, I greatly appreciate it. And once again, thank you so much.